Hello, everyone. It's my honor and privilege to be with you here today on World Sound Healing Day. Today, I'm going to cover um, some of the foundations of the, the scientific basis behind a clinical use of sound, a more scientific use of sound um, that involves sort of the um, an overview of w what is brainwave entrainment, how it works, this concept of binaural beats and why and how those work, uh, um, sort of a scientific overview of how we can use modern high-tech instrumentation that can view the brain and can, use, and can view the autonomic nervous system, the master control system of the body, and see that on a computer screen, and then use that to tune highly specific sound frequencies for healing. Uh, and the bigger uh, issue that I want uh, to talk about where all this really needs to go is the very kind of thing that we're doing today, right now. The, this concept of bringing a large number of people together, in this case, people who already understand the power of sound to heal and transform consciousness, <clears throat> and as an aid to meditation and relaxation and uh, healing, uh, where a lot of us come together for something like the World Sound Healing Day, or the uh, a large organization for world peace or for heal the earth or a, a lot of these different things have been happening over the, over time now in the last few years and i believe that there is a, a scientific way to hone that and align that even better to create a real possibility of aligning people's consciousness together in large groups to create sort of a hundredth monkey idea and create change in the quantum field. So this concept of a global mind link where we're precisely aligning people's consciousness together through a global application of brainwave entrainment is what we're going to be talking about today. And it would be best if you have a set of headphones uh, because at the end we're going to have a a global group meditation with a soundtrack that I prepared with entrainment or in training everybody's brainwaves to exactly the same place together as we all listen live <clears throat> to a common soundtrack. So let's get started. So, you know, it's a great place to, <laughs> to begin with the new discoveries in brain science and brain imaging <clears throat> with brain mapping computers that are very sophisticated, with uh, advanced sort of medical forms of heart rate variability monitoring that can really see the live activity of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system in the center of your brain. These global brain mapping computer systems give incredible levels of detail in 3D not only of what brain web activity is going on, but where in the cortex it's located. Newest advancements in that are now showing layers of brainwave activity stacked on top of each other six layers deep in the gray matter of the cortex. This is absolutely new information that's happening right now, just in the last few weeks. <clears throat> the fact that this you know, three pound little quasi gelatinous <laughs> sort of quantum biocomputer thing that fits in your hands is probably the number one most complex thing in the whole universe. The fact that it can contemplate its own existence is the, the real mind blower factor here. And exploring all the things that are going on inside of this structure and it's deep associated with consciousness itself, which somehow is linked with electrical depolarizations of neurons in your brain that fire together in sweeps of depolarization across the cortex, you know, in what we call brain waves, right? Waves of depolarization 
And for some reason, the speed of these depolarizations are closer aligned with consciousness states, beta, alpha, theta, delta, and beyond. <clears throat> Here at the Center for Neuroacoustic Research, we currently work with 21 different brain states. Many of those we have discovered ourselves uh, or are on the cutting edge of that. And I'll get into that in a, in a bit. The earliest use of brainwave entrainment to change consciousness was most likely shamanic drumming practices. I've done extensive research into uh, taking recordings of shamanic drum ceremonies that do transform consciousness back to the lab, back to, to the uh, recording studio, doing spectral analyses of uh, the drum beats and sort of a bunch of other things like that. We're trying to find out what's going on. Why would pounding a drum have an effect on your brain? And when we look at that, we can see that we have a little drum here. And in order to, you know, get into character, I have to kind of do my thing here. You might, if, if I look familiar, you might have seen me in the Heal documentary. I've been on um, the, the Gaia Network in a 10-part series on sound. You should check that out. Um, I did a crazy episode uh, at the History Channel with the Ancient Aliens episode that was on sound. <laughs> that was kind of funny. So when we start pounding a drum, that speed of the drum beat is around five cycles per second. Five cycles per second is a brainwave speed in theta. Theta is where you brainwaves go when you're dreaming at night. And in a non-dream state, 5 hertz is where we access creativity, problem solving. Um, anyone who's a creative person, an artist or a musician or a dance or anything, uh, goes into brainwave states of high amplitude theta when you're in this uh, creative mode. It's also access to emotions in the dream phase. Dreaming sleep is always emotional. In other words, you're being chased by the boogeyman and you think it's real. Um, that's how, how real it sparks the emotions. And so theta is the portion of night when emotions are being worked on. And therapeutically, in a clinical environment, brainwave entrainment to theta opens uh, the system up to dealing with emotional issues. So when you start to align these factors together in a, a therapeutic atmosphere, you're sort of um, stacking the deck in your favor for a favorable outcome. Every culture has got its sound tradition. Every culture on the planet has used sound as its primary tool, mostly for spirituality and for deepening my meditation and my access to higher modes of experience. So, you know, I haven't had one of those guys too. So we've done extensive research uh, in our lab of what's going on with Tibetan bowls and why they work. Uh, in the past, uh, I've worn many hats. One of those hats was as a sculptor with molten metal and mold making. I became an expert in metallurgy and in alloys. And alloys mean you're mixing different metals together to form a new metal, an alloy metal. And so that's pretty much what this is, is an alloy of different metals. Uh, this one is bronze bowl. There's brass bowls that look a little bit more yellow than this. Uh, but this kind of golden color, that's, that's the hallmark of bronze, which is um, mostly copper and tin, and uh, usually a third metal like uh, uh, antimony or bismuth or something like that. Uh, something about is rubbing these bowls. The tone and the quality of that tone centers the mind. So it's a great tool for meditation. But if you listen within that sound, there is a pulsing sound. 
wah, 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 wah. And that pulsing sound is a brainwave entrainment frequency. So just when I think I've, you know, packed myself with 50,000 bucks worth of gear and there's all high tech and brainwave monitors and you know, high tech keyboards for doing sound and changing consciousness, I find out that the, you know, the Tibetans did it 3000 years ago already. So this concept that the bowl <clears throat> has a pulsing in it that's pulsing at a brainwave speed that would cause a brainwave entrainment response to put you into a state of meditation. And each of these different types of bowls generate different types of pulse speeds, which means it picks the lock of different uh, neuro program of meditating in this particular type of brain state. And every different type of brain state has its own unique characteristics of a meditation experience. Um, for instance, in 2001, the Dalai Lama did a research project at the University of Wisconsin, where they hooked up some of his monks who had been meditating for 30 years and hooked them up to EEG machines and fMRI machines and a bunch of other different types of devices and had them go into these very high states to see what's going on in the brain with somebody who's experiencing sort of, like, sort of enlightenment. And what they saw with, with that group was a high amplitude of gamma brain activity. And gamma is something that was discovered in the late 80s uh, by accident during open brain surgery. So they've got the top of the skull off and they've got the brain exposed and they've got EEG electrodes right on the brain itself. And they picked up these very high frequency brain waves that they could never have seen before. Because in the brainwave world, the more rapid the brain waves, the, the lower the amplitude, right? So in beta, which is 13 hertz up to about 38, it used to be 13 to 30 when I first went to school 45 years ago. That got extended when they discovered gamma at 40 hertz, which is extremely rapid. Uh, and so they extended the range of beta to 13 to 38. And so 13 to 38, cycles per second, waves of depolarization per second across your cortex is associated with externally directed, focused, goal-oriented attention. <clears throat> you and me right now in beta. There is low, mid, and high beta with various levels of attention. Um, but once you cross over 13 hertz at the lower end and you go into alpha, that's peripheral vision. That's holographic mind. That's not focused on a single thing, it's focused on everything. That's the kind of sign that you see with uh, Zen practice. Zazen, I'm sitting on a pillow in a room with my eyes closed and I know very well that I'm here in this room and that I'm experiencing various things like certain sounds, certain smells, certain sensations, from my five senses, but it's like a, a homogeneous mandala. I'm not paying attention to any one of those. I'm paying attention to the whole field. So that's very much different if than something, once the brain waves go down and cross over at somewhere between seven and eight hertz into theta, and I've got somebody meditating with their eyes closed in theta, they ha are not aware that they're in the room or that their body is here. They're someplace else completely in what appears to be subconscious image imagery, like a dream zone, uh, like, <clears throat> you know, what the Aborigines just, you know, discuss as dream time. Shamanic journeying is that way, pounding the drum putting you on a sh shamanic journey, pounding the drum at theta to put you in a shamanic journey where you're climbing a mountain or going in a cave or something and talking to a totem animal or meeting some shaman in a subconscious realm who's giving you some secret you need to know. That's where you are. Your body is in this room, but your consciousness is someplace else completely. And that's a hallmark of a theta brainwave entrainment, a, a, a theta brain state meditation. Delta is something, Epsilon is something, Gamma is something. And so here we've got the Dalai Lama in the University of Wisconsin 
doing this research and seeing high amplitudes of gamma, <clears throat> and the monks are reporting experiencing sort of a universal empathy for all living things in the universe, this grandiose empathy of the heart associated with gamma. As, uh, so when you go into the brainwave sort of realm uh, and you see that delta, very slow brain waves at one hertz, two hertz, three hertz, uh, one brain pulse every two seconds has got a huge amplitude, but beta at 20 hertz has got a very small amplitude because the same brain energy is being used to make 20 of them. And if it only has to make two of them, each of those has a huge amplitude. That's where the energy is going. So at 40 hertz, gamma, the amplitude is so small it can't penetrate the skull. That's why nobody ever measured it with an EEG. And that's why they could only pick it up with open brain surgery with the EEG electrodes right on the brain. Then they could see this 40 hertz activity. And as a matter of fact, they saw 100 hertz activity and 200 hertz activity. Super, uh, extremely rapid brain activity that nobody really knows what's, what that even means. As far as I know, our lab is the only one that has been researching it for all these years. The, uh, we renamed it. We, it didn't have a name, so we named uh, the 100 hertz hypergamma and the 200 hertz as lambda. And we have certain thoughts about what we think they mean or where they go. Uh, and that's for probably another broadcast. Back in Scientific American in October 1973 was this article called Auditory Beats in the Brain by Gerald Oster. He's the one who started the whole thing with binaural beats and brain entrainment. Brain entrainment had been around, but binaural beats had not. This concept that if you have two separate tones combined together, that are slightly out of tune, you'll get a beat that appears that's the difference between these two. So for instance, if I have two speakers with 100 hertz and 105 hertz, these pressure waves of sound are pushing air molecules and the air molecules are colliding together slightly out of phase, 100, 105 out of phase by five, and so we'll hear this sort of a wah-wah appearing between the two speakers. It's one of those phantom things. And the brain waves will entrain to that wah-wah pulsing of the air molecules if the pulsing is a brainwave speed. And that's what he was researching at here. Was he was using sine waves, a man-made tone with no harmonics because uh, it was a scientific experiment. Then he moved this on to headphones and so now the question is, this Wawa is sort of a phantom, because if I shut one speaker off, the Wawa disappears and I just hear one tone coming out of one speaker. I bring the other speaker up and the Wawa starts to magically appear. But if I put headphones on, now we've got something else going on. Like if I put headphones on, I've got 100 and 105, and I hear a five cycle a second pulse in the middle of my head, and my brain waves and train to that. Different. The, the difficulty is, where is that pulse coming from? Because it's not collision of air molecules anymore, because you've got a solid head between two headphones. You've revealed a real quirk of neurophysiology here, a quirk of brain function. This hemisphere listens to this ear. This hemisphere listens to this ear. And these two ears are hearing something that the other ear is not hearing. Right, And that has never happened in our whole biological evolution. There's never a time in nature where this ear would be able to hear something that this one doesn't hear. So uh, particularly simultaneously at the same time. So that's a conundrum for the brain. And any time that there's something unknown and weird, the brain has to associate it with a stress until it can be checked out to make sure my life is not being threatened. So it initiates sort of a modified fight or flight response. And in order to check this out, what it forces the brain to do is to synchronize the electrical activity of both hemispheres across the corpus callosum and create brain wave synchronicity between the two hemispheres. And that's no small thing because this concept of brain of, of synchronicity of the hemispheres 
is a very sought after thing throughout all of time of humanity. It's where the aha moment happens. It's where the inspiration moment takes place. It's where the answer to your questions just drops in. It's where you gain access to higher modes of information that is not small mind, small calculating mind. It's access to big mind and it's the moment of enlightenment. It's what we want. What we all strive for unconsciously is access to that state. And now if we use headphones with these two tones slightly out of tune, we force this, we trick the brain into making this happen. So that's a very powerful new development since 1973. And then everybody started jumping on the bandwagon and producing binaural beat soundtracks for sale on the market. And like everything in humanity, uh, you know, most are entrepreneurs who don't really exactly know what they're doing, but uh, it's so powerful it works anyway. But in the hands of somebody who really knows what they're doing, this is a super powerful tool for healing and for cracking open the barriers to access of the deepest parts of myself for a level of high-grade scientific high-tech meditation that we've never seen before. So here we have the two speakers with the 100 and 105. Their crossover sweet spot creates a beat, a phantom beat that you entrain to. It's different if you've got headphones on, then we get the synchronicity of the hemispheres. This idea that slower brain frequencies have higher uh, amplitudes and faster brain frequencies, as in beta, have lower amplitudes. As I said, we have uh, identified 21 different brain states. So the regular ones that I learned in school, beta, alpha, theta, delta, where delta is 0 0.5 hertz to 3.5 or 4, uh, theta, three and a half to four to seven, uh, alpha somewhere between seven and eight to 13, and beta 13 all the way up to 38 hertz. And so I need to uh, update this chart because this is the old school before they discovered gamma. But we have high gamma and now we've got um, high beta and now we've got gamma and hyper gamma and lambda down here in epsilon. Back in uh, 1988, uh, 89, I was uh, measuring EEG of every single patient for two years to sort of uh, observe myself, this brainwave entrainment phenomenon on EEG and the synchronicity of the hemispheres with headphones uh, in my clinical practice. And I noticed that in some of these patients, the brainwave frequencies were dropping below the lowest range of delta into some new unknown territory that they told us and taught us in school wasn't there. You know, they, to you know, they told us, here's the house, beta, alpha, theta, delta, and there's no attic and there's no basement, and I just discovered a basement. Frequency below 0 0.5 hertz. And every person that I saw that show up in had a tale to tell. I mean, they'd get off the table afterwards and say, wow, you won't believe I was out of my body. I was floating through the ceiling. I went home, found my keys. People were reporting precognitive experiences that were starting to happen by exposure to these below delta brain activity. I started doing a global search. Has anybody else been reporting below delta brain activity? The answer is no. Later, I did two years of clinical work with neurofeedback where I had access to brain mapping computers so I could see what's going on. And I asked that person, have you, have you ever seen below delta brain activity? And she said, no, but come to think of it, I wouldn't be able to because none of these big expensive EEG machines show below one hertz. And that was like, what? <laughs> it really tells you something about humanity in general that because they believe so solidly that the total range of brain waves is 0 0.3 to, uh, I mean, uh, 0 0.5 hertz to say, you know, 38 hertz, then we don't even show anything beyond that in our software. 
We don't believe it's there, so therefore we don't need to see it. Therefore, you wouldn't even be able to discover it if it was there. And the reason I was able to discover it was because the EEG equipment I was using was given to me by a company in Holland as a brand new product of the first EEG machine that could plug into a regular home computer and not have to buy $30,000 worth of dedicated equipment for uh, you know, a sort of advanced brain mapping. This could be a simple EEG machine that gets all the work done, um, but with no filters and no blinders. So all of a sudden I could see all these exotic brain frequencies and you know, I had to admit that maybe I'm not the great genius I thought I was, that maybe it was just surrounded by idiots who have blinders on that couldn't have discovered even if they wanted to. But I named it. I named it the next Greek letter down from Delta, Epsilon. And then I started, uh, you know, once I realized that, wow, they told us there was no, you know, basement here, and let's see if there's a sub-basement. So I started exploring frequencies below that. Then I realized that they had discovered gamma and hypergamma and lambda. And so all of a sudden I realized they've discovered an attic and an attic above that and an attic above that. And so now I've just threw all the rules out. It's like, well, how slow do the brain waves go and how fast do they go? Everything else that we know about the physics of how nature systems are put together is there's no limits there. There is no conceivable place of how slow the brain waves could ever go or how fast they could ever go. The limit is our ability to measure that or not. And if we can't measure it, we tend to think that it doesn't exist and that's kind of stupid. So, and then as I was to find out, uh, actually uh, they discovered the default mode network in 2001 by also by accident with fMRI machines uh, these are extremely slow. This is a brain, uh, the default mode network uh, is one brain pulse every 10 to 20 seconds. Now, epsilon, you know, the, low, the lowest delta at 0 0.5 is one brain pulse every two seconds. Epsilon, what I was seeing was one brain pulse every two to four seconds. Uh, epsilon 2 is one brain pulse every four to eight seconds. And I was just ready to go into an, another strata of, say, Epsilon 3, when default mode network was discovered at one brain pulse every 10 to 20 seconds, which is just where Epsilon 3 would have been in that territory. Uh, and so that leads us to experimental brain frequencies of IOTA 1 and 2. I just published an album of this two months ago, where the brain frequencies are extremely slow. One brain pulse every 20 to 40 seconds, and every 40 to 80 seconds. And brain waves at this speed are beginning to align with Earth's biome. In other words, now we're getting into the sort of the respiration phase of trees and plants. And I, I looked upon it as a way of uh, consciously linking with all life forms on the planet as meditation. And then, um, uh, and I've been experimenting with iota now for 20 years. And so just uh, three months ago, there was actually two months ago, there was a big article in my news feeds that showed a mysterious earth pulse that happens one pulse every 26 seconds. Iota is every 20 to 40 seconds. So 26 seconds is right in my Iota one framework that confirmed to me, they call it earth's heartbeat. So really that's what IOTA is uh, in training you to is the planet itself and its biome. Uh, we also have these borderline frequencies, which I, I don't have time to discuss today, but I have a number of um, live streams that I, ha that I do on a regular basis. Two years ago, 
I, I did two years of live streams and took a year's break, and I've been picking them up again. I've done another 14. Uh, there are talks just like this um, on all kinds of different subjects, but I've spent a lot, a great deal of time on all the 21 brain states and what they need, what they mean. Um, I'll give the address at, at the end of this. So we have this uh, system. So, so for instance, you, once you understand that if I listen to headphones and, and the binaural beats in there at a certain brain speed will make my brain waves travel to that speed and lock there and change my state of consciousness in the process. I've extended that beyond into something called couples therapy. So now I've got two people who are a couple, uh, both with headphones on, listening to the same single soundtrack of brain entrainment. It's in training both people's brain waves to exactly and precisely the, brain, the same brain state. So one of the research projects on our shelf, I mean, you know, I've got, my life tends to be triage. I've got, you know, 3,000 incredibly important projects to do on the shelf, time to do three and money to do one, that kind of a thing. But this project of our, our, is a, a couple who are already intimately linked, sleep together and go into dream phase together, both wearing headphones with a binaural beats in theta. Can we link people in the same dream? I think that's entirely possible. But studies done with EEG certainly show that two people listening to the same brainwave and train the soundtrack uh, link their brainwaves to the same state. That's a mind link between two people. If we put you both precisely and exactly in the same brain state, same state of consciousness, uh, now we've got the underpinnings for a larger picture of, of sort of what that could be, where two people's brainwaves can be confirmed with the EEG to link together when they're listening to the same brainwave entrainment soundtrack. We could expand that into the whole family, right? Because that would be important. And the next step is to expand it into a group mind link where everyone meditates together listening to the same soundtrack. And we want it to be listening with headphones so that we get the synchronicity of the right left hemispheres, which gives the group mind that arises out of this access to higher planes of information and experience that only synchronicity gives us, right? So that sort of forms the basis for the live stream series that I that I do every Sunday at noon. So I invite every, all of you to, to come and check that out. You can see all the previous uh, broadcasts uh, on my YouTube channel, which I'll give you the address at the end of this. Um, the, uh, but the, the concept of a global mind link is what I feel to be the missing piece when we do a world peace day or a world uh, Earth Day, or a, a, you know, a world uh, a connection between people to meditate for world peace or for saving the planet or for whatever it is, there's um, a, it's a good idea because there is something to be said for the hundredth monkey syndrome, the idea that you connect a, a minimum quantum number of people together and you have the possibility of tipping the quantum field. Uh, I believe uh, that in a personal way, that's what's happening with spontaneous remission. Uh, spontaneous remission, the something about uh, sort of the, de the, the cancer death sentence causes a rift deep enough that my spirit can break free and realign what I want the next moment to be instead of me being somebody who's dying of cancer. That something arises in my deep part that stands up and, s and rejects that idea and says no to it. And therefore the next moment from now, it is no, it's gone. The, the tumor, the inoperable tumor in my brain has now just somehow magically disappeared and the doctors are scratching their heads thinking maybe I was looking at the wrong x-ray or something. but. 
those of us who understand the new f physics of the quantum field realize that in the quantum world, things pop in and out of existence all the time. Time goes forwards and backwards and particles pop in and out. You know, it's uh, what's, and there is a macro world, this world um, link to that. Qu the quantum rules do exist here if you tap your consciousness a certain way to tap it. And that's what I believe this has the possibility of doing, creating large groups of people. And I, right now, the groups of people that follow these live streams and participate in these group mind links as a scientific experiment in consciousness to see if we can shift the quantum field together are spread all over the world. I've got uh, people in Asia and Taiwan and Hong Kong and Europe and uh, Australia and South America and all over the U.S. that tune in every Sunday. It's a, a grand group uh, that's pushing the edge of an experiment together. So we already know the answer to this question. <laughs> Everything is one. It's an illusion that I'm here and you're there. And consciousness is the playground where we find that to be so if we can get deep enough into our consciousness in a certain states of meditation. Science to, has given us the tools now to push the envelope of a new level of science brought to bear in the science of consciousness and the science of enlightenment. We know what EEG pictures of of high state meditators look like. We know where their brains go. And with technology over here that can precisely align your brain waves to any state we want to bring you to, it would be wise to bring to and train you to these known patterns of super high states of meditation, sort of like an advanced high tech training wheels. Nobody can explain to you what you're supposed to do to meditate. How do I meditate? How do you answer that question? How do I reach this high state of meditation I'm trying to achieve? Nobody can truly answer that question from words coming out of small mind to another person's word processing center in their small mind. Because essentially small mind has to exit out of the picture and big mind has to take over. It stands to reason if we can use science to entrain your brainwaves smack dab in the middle of this state you're trying to get to, We've viscerally shown you, as an, as an experience, what it feels like to be in this place that is an unexplainable thing to try to tell somebody what you do to get there. And the concept of critical mass. If you get a critical mass of things, then something shifts, a tipping point, the hundredth monkey effect, this idea that, uh, you know, Theory argues that when a committed minority reaches a critical group size, the, the social sh system crosses a tipping point, a cascade of behavior change. This is what we're trying to do precisely. Let's say if we have 100,000 people linked together through a Zoom channel like this, all meditating for world peace. There's no two people in that group of all those people who have the same concept of meditation. No two people in that whole group are going to meditate and get to the same state. Essentially, it's like a, a good effort, but it's herding cats. It's too non-focused to get the real work done that requires a certain level of precision that you can't get that way. It's on the right path. It's heading towards the right place. We certainly know that power is in numbers, but the power in numbers has to be focused and it has to be focused under the hood not up here all the good intentions up here equal nothing they have to filter down and open up something in my heart that gets involved in my deep consciousness before a thought that's the part that gets the work done and if we can align that part in many people and do it with a high level of precision we actually have a, tra a chance of shifting the quantum field to a new outcome in our experience in the world at large.
hundredth monkey idea. I think most people have heard about this idea of the hundredth monkey, where anthropologists were studying monkeys on a little island with a whole bunch of islands of monkeys, and they saw, you know, one monkey washing its sweet potato, washing the dirt off before it ate it. Another monkey saw that, started doing the same thing. More and more monkeys got involved by monkey see, monkey do. And pretty soon when a critical mass of monkeys on this island were all washing their potatoes, all of a sudden something shifted in the quantum field and all monkeys on all islands instantaneously knew how to wash their potatoes without seeing somebody else do it. It became an under the hood quantum shift in reality. That's the idea here um, where uh, you, you can get a certain number of people and build it up and build it up more and more people and aligning them more and more precisely until you reach a tipping point and then a cascade takes place all on its own that's inscrutable in the world. The hundredth monkey effect, hundredth monkey effect is a hypothetical phenomenon in which a new behavior or idea is said to spread rapidly by unexplained means from one group to all related groups once a critical number of members of one group exhibit the new behavior uh, or the new brain state where it is exactly aligned together, brain states exactly aligned, weaving a new outcome in the world. So this global mind link live streams is um, my invitation to you to come and join our merry band of crazy people who understand that you're not going to be able to the world is too corrupted, it's too entrenched. There's no way we're going to be able to sort of legislate our way out of the mess that the world at large is in. And out of all the possible outcomes that our collective unconscious mind could dream up as a reality to live in, this is the one that we have all chosen. This is an external projection of our collective unconscious mind. The world that we're living in is us projecting that. And it's us who go inside and change that vision that changes the projection. Uh, but I'm submitting that there has to be a level of, uh, of uh, perfection and alignment there that is currently missing. <clears throat> Uh, this all goes back to, you know, a, a monastery off the coast of England called Linda's Farm. Uh, it was a monastery populated by monks who understood esoteric Christianity, the, the Essenes and the Gnostics, uh, and understood the principle of the hundredth monkey before it was ever a hundredth monkey idea, that two or more gathered in, quote, his name, call down the Holy Spirit. And actually, the number was not two or more, it was twelve. 12 disciples and the master. That was Christ and that was Zoroaster and it was Muhammad and it was all the great leaders of time have had 12 disciples. It's the first critical mass magic number of people that have to be minimally present and consciousness aligned. And remember, these people all studied the same text, all lived together in a monastery for decades and well understood that when they went to a state of meditation or or a prayer that they were going to this place and so that helped to align these groups together and the concept of Lindisfarne was a group of 12 monks coming together to try to change the course of the world from at the time of the 12th century that was the Inquisition and the Dark Ages. The result of that was <clears throat> the you know a, a, re a rebellion against the Church of England and the Pope that split off a group called the Protestant movement and the Protestants split into various sects of Protestants and Methodists and Episcopalians. And I was a military kid, so I tried many of those. We moved and moved and moved and joined the church that was closest. So I got firsthand experience of being a Methodist and a Presbyterian and a Protestant, you know. Um, so, 
this idea that we get these uh, aligned consciousness monks together who understand certain esoteric principles of entering into a state of meditative prayer where they align precisely together and some new thing drops down that gives them the chance of influencing the next moment from now in the quantum field. Of course, they didn't know any of any of those terms at that time, but that's the idea is groups of people aligned properly together, call down spirit, call down the light forces. Now this guy, William Irwin Thompson in the sixties, uh, brought back this idea of Lindisfarne and started something called the Lindisfarne Association. He was a contemporary of uh, Richard Alpert, who became bombed, uh, Baba Ramdas, and, uh, you know, Timothy Leary and Gunther Weil, all psychiatrists using psychedelics for therapy, which has now come full circle. We're back. Psychedelic therapy with psychiatrists. Uh, psychiatrists in the, in the U.S., uh, there's a large group that use just my soundtracks because they're powerful for psychedelic therapy. But William Irwin Thompson uh, was bringing back this idea to take the, the most powerful minds of the time in the 1960s and align them together in the same way that the monastery did to try to make a change in world history, because at that period of time, it was the Vietnam War, and it was the awakening of consciousness in a huge level for make love, not war, and sort of the uh, consciousness revolution that uh, the cameras pointed and called them hippies. And it was, uh, it was save the planet and organic food. And that whole movement sprung from that period of time when at the same time, uh, William Irwin Thompson and the Lindisfarne Association with some very powerful people in Northampton, Massachusetts were meditating together to shift the quantum field. Uh, the future is beyond knowing, the present is beyond belief. That's William Irwin Thompson. All of this based on the underlying laws of the laws of coupled oscillators and biological synchronization. This is a scientific law that um, animate and inanimate objects in the universe are attempting always to align together and synchronize together and oscillate together. It's why the wine glass vibrates when you sing the right note. It's why anybody who practices sound as a healing tool, it's why it works. Why using sound to affect other people is working because of the underlying coupled oscillators principle. Aligning people together and doing it scientifically I mean, I did this with, um, you know, Fortune 100 companies, Mattel, Cisco, Nike. Um, I was hired to come in and boost create creativity and problem solving. And so as team building, I had all the members sit in a circle and hold hands. And... Um, I measured them with an advanced heart rate variability system I've got, where I put some of the pads on this person's wrist and some of the pads on this person's wrist so that the HRV had to go through every single person in order to complete the connection so that the HRV screens, the sympathetic parasympathetic that I saw on my screen was actually the autonomic nervous system of the group entity. And you could see the stress uh, among these people. And then I could do a sound sweep to find a frequency that would collapse that stress to zero. And I just scientifically collapsed the stress in the group. Now we could really align. But if I had a group like this listening to just a generic soundtrack, everybody with headphones on, and that soundtrack had binaural beats that were in training everybody in this group to the same place, we would have a powerful group experience. Um, so that's, that's the concept of the, the group mind link to form an opening in a higher dimensional plane to make massive change on a worldwide sort of level, aligning together for a purpose that we begin to define. And that's, Pretty much what the live stream is doing is trying to define 
once you get there and you can make a change, what change do you want to want to make? What what is it? What would the world look like? How do you envision what what kind of world we would like to have? If no two people are on the same page with that, then we're herding cats once again. <clears throat> Even we we use science to align everybody's brainwaves to the same brain state, so we've got the possibility of making change. But no two people have the same idea what they're asking for. We've got another problem. So. Uh, part of the purpose of the live streams is to continually work on what world are we asking for. God says you can have anything you want. All you got to do is ask for it without words, before a thought. Get into the state, envision it with your heart. This is what I want. I want to. That's the refinement sort of process. So, joining together in a sort of a brother-sisterhood of living beings who understand the principles, the esoteric principles of joining together has power to change at a quantum level, allows us to use science to help us do that. Um, and it's actually can't even happen. Science is exploring a link between our minds and the quantum world. It's like it's not just fancy schmancy ideas. There are Nobel Prize winning physicists who know this to be true, who are seeing it in action and are actively exploring this thing, this, this phenomenon, where a new birth of humanity has a possibility of emerging and us consciously taking control of our own evolution and uh, taking control of what we uh, experience as reality altogether being alive on this beautiful and wonderful planet that could be such an incredible place to be. It's us aligning, coming together. That's how it works. Uh, it just needs to, to be refined enough so that it's got a real chance of happening. Um, so, you know, where we can explode ourselves with a whole new concept of what it could be like you know, to be here and be alive together. <clears throat> so, with that being said, you know I, I said that I'm that we're going to do that right now. So, get your headphones out. I have a soundtrack that when we all listen to this together right now live, we put headphones on and. The brainwave entertainment soundtrack will align everybody's brainwaves together to exactly the same place. And in that place, open yourself up to why we were created in the universe as a people. What's our job? What's our duty? What kind of world do we deserve to have? That's where we're going with this. So headphones, please. And here we go.
Mm. So, thank you all for being here. It's my joy and pleasure to be with you today. Um, I'm going to show um, uh, various website links. Uh, this first one here is um, on my website of Scientific Sounds. That's generic soundtracks that are out there to use. Um, you can listen to each one of them with a short sample. Uh, this one here is the current address to the YouTube channel of my current live streams that happen every Sunday at 1230 California time. I'm in San Diego. <clears throat> HTTP, HTTPS bit.ly slash global mind link. And this next one is um, all of the previous live streams I did over two years um, previously. Uh, that's bit.ly Dr. Thompson Live. Make sure that the D and the T and the L are capitalized. Down here is the website for the Sky Collective. That represents the worldwide um, uh, Biotuning uh, High Tech Sound Healing Association. I have trained and certified people all over the world, and this is the collective of those people. Uh, so, once again, thank you all very much. Um, peace and blessings to all. <clears throat>